All right, so assisting with nutrition, chapter six, 17. Um, food and nutrition are important parts of your life. The most accurate way that we know that you're eating is by getting your weight. So if you're not eating, you're going to lose weight. If you are eating too much, you are going to gain weight. So eating and nutrition is very important for staying healthy as well because people need to eat to get nutrients to stay well. But everybody has different food preferences, different food customs. They have a revolving food menu, but they also have to offer alternatives. So just because the person doesn't want to eat the meatloaf and the mashed potatoes, we still need to offer them an alternative, something that they can eat, whether it be soup or a sandwich or salad or something. And everywhere you work, they have a different menu, but it's usually the same things over and over and over again. Um, your patients or residents get to pick their likes and their dislikes. Those are okay. If they come out on their tray, you can offer it. If they don't like it, it's listed on their meal ticket that they dislike broccoli, and broccoli comes on their tray. You can still give it to them because they're not allergic to it. Okay? You can leave the tray with the broccoli and then go get them something else to eat instead of the broccoli. Offer an alternative. That is fine. But if something comes out and it says they are allergic to it on their meal ticket and it's like shrimp, if you have a tray that has shrimp on it, do not set it in front of that person. Okay. With the therapeutic diets, they are diets that are ordered by a physician for someone who has a, a physical condition or a health condition. So if you know you have a diabetic person, you can't leave a tray in front of them that has cake and sugar and cookies and stuff on it. There are abbreviations on their meal tickets, and the meal ticket abbreviation is no concentrated sugar. It'll say NCS on it. That means they can't have concentrated sugars, no cakes and cookies and frosting and things like that. They do make sugar-free desserts and sugar-free puddings and sugar-free lemon pies that they can have, but it will stay on there diabetic or sugar-free. It'll be labeled on the plastic wrap that it's covered in. So just make sure as like a second checkpoint that when you're giving these people things, you know what's on their therapeutic diet. If somebody has a pureed diet because they can't chew or they have no teeth or they have difficulty swallowing or dysphagia, that pureed diet and then you get a regular tray that has fried chicken and bacon on it, don't leave that in front of the person, you know, because they're going to try to eat it <laughs> even though they should be on pureed food. So I guess it's like that. Report it to the nurse. If it's the wrong diet, you're going to report it to the nurse. If it's just something that they have a preference for, that they don't want what they have, or they want the alternative, you don't need to let the nurse know. You could just go back to dietary, tell the cook or the dietary aides they want the alternative. <laughs> Yeah. Y'all talking about crazy? <laughs> it's better if ahead of time the menus are posted on the yes. walls. So it's better if the residents know what the menu is for the day and they tell you ahead of time they don't want that, they want the alternative. Then the cooks only have to cook the alternative instead of sending out a tray and then waiting 30 minutes for them to get their alternative. So most people who like to complain or who want the alternatives look at the menu. And the menus are hung every morning so that they know oh, today is fried chicken day, but I don't want that. I just want a soup, or I want a salad, or I want to... <laughs> but people are picky on what they eat, and they are allowed to be. We have to make sure they have an alternative, make sure they have something to eat that they like to eat. Um, now, we're not gourmet chefs, and we can't cook them everything they want, but there is an alternative to what the main meal for the day is. Um, this is just an example of what the meal tickets kind of look like. And this meal ticket, it has the room number, it has the patient's name, um, and then it has what kind of diet they are on. So this is a, uh, let's see, mechanically soft diet. But then it tells you what is on the tray. What should be on your tray is fortified cream of wheat, two pancakes, a fried egg, and this is breakfast. Here in the allergies column, that's what I'm saying. If it has allergies listed and you see that allergy on the tray, don't leave it for them. Let the nurse know. If it just says dislikes, like here it says she dislikes eggs and grit and oatmeal <laughs> and scrambled eggs. <laughs> but we still gave her four to five cream of wheat, two pancakes, and a fried egg for breakfast. So she didn't get an egg or a scrambled egg, but it says she doesn't like fried eggs either. But we're not going to not give her the tray just because it has a dislike on it. 
She may try it. She may not eat it. It's fine. The modifications are going to be if they need some kind of special utensil, like a weighted spoon, or put it in bowls instead of on a plate, or put it in a divided plate, or um, some other modifications they they use for like like the equipment that they're going to need to eat their food. A plate guard is like a little ring that goes on the side of the plate. Some people who are paralyzed can only use one hand, and it's hard to scoop your food up onto your spoon with one hand. You usually use your other hand. Either subconsciously you squish it onto your spoon somehow, or you use your knife and push it onto your spoon. Uh, but they have a little ring that goes on the side of their plate that they can push it up against to get their food, a plate guard to get their food onto their um, spoon. So that would be under modifications. And then preferences and beverages. It's going to list out all of the beverages that are on their plate. They have to be offered water with every meal. They also have to get some kind of milk or dairy product. So they get yogurt or milk or then they can also have tea or coffee, but they'll have like five different items of fluids. <laughs> Those are the fluids that you have to measure more accurately because you know each little juice cup is four ounces and four ounces is 30 milliliters per ounce. So um, four times 30 is 120 milliliters. So if they drink the juice cup, you're gonna write 120 milliliters. It's pretty accurate. You're, you're still guesstimating, like they drink half the juice cup, it's two ounces, then you're gonna do 60 milliliters. But you need to add together all the little things that they drink. They don't have to drink all five of their items. They don't have to drink their juice and their milk and their water. But whatever they drink out of each of them, you're going to kind of tally up your ounces and add them together and multiply them by 30 and then write that on here how many milliliters they drink. Okay. The food is just going by increments of 25%. It's like quarter system. They ate. 25% of their food, they ate at least half of their food, they eat at least 75% of their food, or they ate almost all of their food, more than 75% of their food, but they didn't lick their plate clean, they still get 100%. There can still be food left on the plate and it's still 100%. 75% if there's a, like a big food group, like say she didn't eat the fried egg at all, but she ate the cream of wheat and a pancake then that'd be about 75% of the food. So food is a little less accurate because it's quarters. Liquid is more accurate because you know you can guesstimate how many ounces and multiply it by your 30. Um, things that count as liquid that aren't liquid is jello and ice cream. But applesauce counts as food because applesauce is just pureed food. But if you have a jello cup, that counts towards your liquid. It, and it's also on a clear liquid diet. And if you have your um, frozen things, like because it's a milk product, like frozen ice cream or magic cups, those are 120 milliliters and those count as your fluid. Okay. Now, some people have, we're going to get to it in the video about um, supplements. So some people get a boost with every meal. The boosts are 240 milliliters. They're eight ounce containers, but they say it on there how many ounces they are. The cups that come out are um, eight ounce cups. So if they have a cup of water, it's an eight ounce cup of water. If they have a little tiny cup of juice, it's a four ounce cup. But just kind of guesstimate how much they drink because you're doing intake and output, but every meal you have to write down the fluids they had in and the percentage of meal that they had in. We ideally like people to have at least 75% of every meal. If they start eating less than 75% of their meals, we need to let the nurse know. If you have a diabetic person that hasn't eaten anything or just picked at it and you put 25%, you need to let the nurse know staff so that we can get them to eat something before we give them their insulin. So if you have four or five days, you got to go see that woman four or five times to be one out of problem. Yeah. <laughs> Constantly, you gotta go. You gotta go it. tell her <laughs> she didn't eat. <laughs> they didn't eat. That's what I was getting. You gotta constantly keep going back to this woman and saying, hey, "Well, that nurse is on your hall you too." Yeah. Because mm -hmm. okay. the nurse is on the hall too, taking care of your same patient. But the nurse may have more of the patients. Like the nurse will have maybe twenty patients and two CNAs, and so maybe you have ten of them, and somebody else has ten of them. 
So then the nurse is in charge of all 20 of them, but you're coming to tell her because you're the eyes and ears of the nurse. That's why you're going to come tell us when things are wrong. Okay, well, that's what I'm going to Miss Jones and Miss Elliot back. They all got the same problem. I got to constantly come back. Just come and let us know. Mm -hmm. So that we're all just working as a team and trying to get what's best for the patient. No, I'm going to be like, oh, my God. It comes again. <laughs> <laughs> no, but then there's also times where, like, we have to just go and try to encourage the resident to do something. So it's a team effort to get them to do what they're supposed to do. Yes. <laughs> they're not in prison, so but we've got. The nurses we've got. What I am, really, because <laughs> Come let us know because the residents won't. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But now sometimes they'll tell you they're in pain or sometimes they'll tell you they're hungry. And, but usually they wait until they're somebody tells on them. <laughs> yeah, a lot of that. Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah. So, but some, some people just Remember don't like to eat. <laughs> <laughs> but, I was only working for like some months. As a dietary aid, mm-hmm. right? So, And food is important. Food yes. is three meals a day. And when we go to clinical, you'll see how much time we spend on breakfast and lunch and dinner. It's like the whole day revolves around breakfast and lunch and dinner. And then there's snacks in between. And the diabetic people have to have their snack. So they get a snack that has protein in it. And if they don't eat their snack, we need to know. So... We had people who were like hoarding their snacks and hiding them in their cabinet. And then, you know, the nurses, we don't go through their stuff. (laughs) But one time I had a patient who told me that she wanted me to get something out of her top drawer. I think it was like her hairbrush or something. And I opened her drawer and it was filled with all of her snacks. I'm like, how long have you been hiding your snacks in your drawer? I was had this this one resident every time. It's like working in a nursing home when I first started working there, I was like, okay. And then one time I was on my own one time. So it's like, oh my gosh, it's really hard. Because I had to get there at 6 o'clock in the morning because residents would come down and wait for your coffee, you mm-hmm. know, all the orange juice and their food, basically. So you had to write down, they hold everything, you had to write everything down the way they want it to be. Then you had to go in the kitchen, you got to tell the chef exactly what it's going to be on there. Then you go back and you got more residents to get in. You got to take care of them too. Also got to take care because I had one side. That lady, she was always late, so I take care of her side too. So yeah. I, you gotta take these little trays out all the time with the food around it and the juice. The first guy didn't make juice for this. Some of them you always have milk, some of them for tea. Um, some just pour like water or orange juice or something like that. But once you work there and you get to know their preferences, yes. then that you know, like, oh, she yes. wants coffee, she wants juice. You're able to anticipate what you're going to get out and stuff. Now, going to clinical, though, when you have a patient ask you for something, you have to look on the care plan before you can give it to them. So just because they asked you for water, don't give them water unless you know that they are allowed to have water. If they are NPO for a procedure, then they can't have water. But they see a new face, and they may try to trick yes. you, and they'll oh say, oh, I have some water. <laughs> and then you give them water, and they're like, no. She was, like, okay, so time for breakfast. So the time for breakfast, some of them don't come. So they come, like, in between the shift. So I always had this one lady. When mm-hmm. she, she knocked on the thing, I'm like, yes. She, she want you prefer Oreos? I thought she was just being nice. So one time I told her, I said, I'm sorry, but breakfast is closed. Like, it's mm-hmm. done with. Oh, I'm not getting you no more cookies and da 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 Oh my God. Aww. And she did not talk to me. Really? <laughs> yeah. Aww. But they use you, though. As soon as they see a fresh new face, like, they oh, do. Man. They try to get you, yes. they trick you into getting them something to drink. Or there is thickened liquids. Some people yes. with dysphagia diets have to have thickened liquids. So this is an example of a thickened coffee. Everything that comes out on their tray is going to be thick like honey or nectar consistency, but they have a cup of hot water. This goes in their cup of hot water. Don't let them drink their cup of hot water without putting the packet in. Mm -hmm. But when you put the packet in and stir it up, it's like tar. It's like really thick, you know? But sometimes they, we have a coffee cart that you're passing out coffee. 
And one of the students one time passed out coffee to the one lady who could have it. And then her roommate said, oh, I'd like some coffee too. <laughs> Knowing she was on thick and liquids, but the student didn't ask and gave her the regular coffee. The By the time the nurse got in there, she had already drank the whole thing. <laughs> So with that, if you accidentally give somebody something that you shouldn't have, just let the nurse know so we can monitor them. We just had to make sure we had to watch her for 24 hours to make sure she hadn't aspirated it. She didn't choke on it. It wasn't in her lungs. She didn't develop pneumonia from it. You're not going to get fired because you accidentally gave somebody something. But you need to make sure it really is a health risk for them. They could, the reason they're on thick and liquids is because when they swallow, their epiglottis doesn't close off their trachea and the fluid goes into their lungs. So sometimes they can develop pneumonia or infection from drinking clear liquids that go down the wrong way. But this thick and liquid thing, this is their packet that you have to put in and stir it up for them. They can't just drink that cup of hot water and you can't give them any coffee off of the coffee cart. We'll be there for um, breakfast and lunch and the snacks. So there's a snack at 10 and a snack at 2. So breakfast, snack, lunch, snack. Those, yeah. Sorry, I thought it was 8 to 5 or 8 to 5? Yeah. Is it 8 to 5? Yeah. They do shift change at 3. Oh, okay. I was just wondering. So, but they, and then dinner doesn't come out until like 5.30, 6 o'clock. But it takes... A long time for each meal. Meals start like two, two and a half hours of each block for meals. So when we get there in the morning, they'll still be passing out breakfast and they'll still be eating breakfast. And then we do snacks and then we'll do lunch with them. And then some people will need help with feeding. But even throughout the day when the snack cart comes out, the diabetic people go towards the snack cart and try to steal <laughs> cookies off of it. <laughs> and then they're like... You'll see them. They're picking them up and putting them in their pocket. And they're like, okay, you can't have that cookie. <laughs> so they Did know. They know. They know to put them back. And then they can have something with protein. They have crackers and peanut butter and cheese. And they have specific snacks made for them. But if you see them up there grabbing all the graham crackers, you know they're not supposed to have them. <laughs> That's a sign. Yeah. Yeah, they, will try you. No, they will. They will try you. <laughs> but that's just like anyone. When you're on this therapeutic diet, nobody follows their therapeutic diet every day, constantly. We're trying to encourage them to be good. But, you know, if families bring in food, they're allowed to eat whatever food the family brings as long as it's part of their diet. Now, if they are on thick and liquids, the family can't bring Cokes. But, I mean, if the family, even though they're on a low-fat, low-sodium diet, the family wants to bring them KFC, they can, just not every day. Like, they need to know that it has to be in moderation. You need to let the nurse know they're bringing it. You don't have to count up all the calories on their food. But if they ate the majority of what their family brought, then give them 100% of their meal for the day. So you're guesstimating that how much calories or how much intake they had. If you think they ate a good portion, then they get 100%. If they ate some but not enough to keep their weight up, then they ate about 75%. You know? And that's why most people are only monthly weights, but then we weigh them once a month and the dietitian trends their weight loss. And then we know if they've lost like more than 10 or 20% of their weight that they are not eating their meals. And then that's when we start adding a supplement, like a boost or an insure to the meals. But when they have those supplements, you have to chart the supplement. Make sure you're charting. They, they drink 240 milliliters of boost. So because those supplements have a lot of calories in them, and we need to know separately how much that supplement they drink as well. You want to encourage them to eat their most nutritious parts of their meal first. You know, people don't like vegetables, but you could just encourage them to try the vegetables. We can't force feed them, but I mean, hopefully some things are appealing to people to eat a good variety of the different food groups. Um, people have personal tastes. People also have cultural preferences. Um, and then mental health states. We're going to talk about dementia patients a little bit later on. But the dementia patients really don't know they need to eat or they forgot they already ate and they tell you they're hungry because they didn't remember that they just ate. 
They also like finger foods because they forget how to use their utensils. You'll see them with a knife trying to like lick the food off their knife because they've forgotten how to use a fork or they stab it with the wrong end of the fork trying to get the food up. So it's better to have like finger foods for them so that they can pick it up and eat it. So. Your social situation, some people like to eat in front of other people, some people like to eat because it's social, eat in the dining room, eat with the group. Other people want to eat alone in their room because they don't want to let other people see how much they eat. So if they are not eating when they're out in public, we may need to consider maybe they want to go back to their room and eat. And maybe they would eat more if they were by themselves so they didn't feel pressured to be around other people. Um, but as a CNA, you have a huge impact on their nutritional status. You're not supposed to rush them. It's supposed to be a here's your food. It's at a warm temperature. It's appealing. It looks good. This is what you, you're going to eat and then encourage them to eat what they can eat. Um, but again, make sure you're giving them the right diet. This is the only skill that when you walk in the room, you are not going to call the person by their name. You need to pick up the meal ticket and say, can you please tell me your name? And let them tell you who they are. Because if you just walk in and say, hi, Mr. Smith, I'm Tanya, your CNA, here's your lunch. He's just going to be like, uh-huh, because yep. here's food. <laughs> but you've got to actually pick up the meal ticket and say, can you please tell me your name? And if they say the right name, then you can give them their tray. Um, provide it in an appealing way. We already talked about the, um, the variety of the meals on this meal cycle, but give them an alternative. And then managing your therapeutic and modified diets in your Mosey's book, there's all kinds of lists about each different therapeutic and modified diet. You, you are not the dietitian, but you need to know what kind of foods come on these kinds of diets. So for clear liquids, it's anything that you can see through. Coffee is considered a clear, a clear liquid, but you can't put creamer in it. So black coffee is a clear liquid. No creamer, no sugar, they can have it on a clear liquid diet. Um, also, jello and popsicles are clear liquids. They're frozen and they're solid, but they're still on a clear liquid diet. Jello and popsicles. But applesauce is not on a liquid diet because applesauce is food that's pureed. Your full liquids is where they can have the dairy products. So then they can have creamers and broths and anything that they want that's a full liquid. Um, mechanically soft is like Salisbury steak and mashed potatoes. You know, Salisbury steak was ground up and smushed back together and then you can eat it. <laughs> Actually, chicken nuggets are mechanically soft. They're ground up pieces of chicken smushed back into a form, then you can eat it, right? But chicken tenders are not mechanically soft. You have to put a little bit more chewing into them to get them down. Okay. If they have a fiber or residue restricted diet, they, they have less bread um, or less fresh fruits and vegetables. If they have a high fiber diet, they have more fruits and vegetables. Raw fruits and vegetables are high in fiber. So if they're constipated, they need to eat more wheat, whole wheat, whole grains, and raw fruits and vegetables to get more fiber. Bland diet means they're not allowed to have any seasonings or spices. So the bland diet is bananas, applesauce, rice, and toast. Things that are just bland and have no seasoning. High calorie diets, if we're doing all the fats and things to try to get them to gain weight and giving them boosts and insures and things like that. Calorie controlled diet is when they're on only like they can't have fried foods. They can only have grilled foods or steamed foods. Um, and then high iron is some red meats and organ meats. Fat controlled means they're not allowed to have the fried chicken. <laughs> they can only have baked chicken. Um, high protein, everybody knows the proteins are your meats. And there's also beans and certain grains like quinoa that have lots of protein in them. Sodium controlled, if they do not get a salt packet on their tray, they probably cannot have salt. It'll say NAS on it. So no added salt is NAS. No concentrated sugar is NCS. But if it says NAS on their meal ticket, it's no added salt. So if they say, oh, I need some salt because it's bland. <laughs> You're on a sodium controlled diet. You can't have salt. 
They also can't have like ramen noodles and canned soups. Those are high, high in sodium for them. Okay. And we already talked a lot about your diabetic diet. So just know just the general parts of those therapeutic diets that somebody may be on. If we tell someone they are on a fluid restricted diet, that means we can't give them extra fluids. Usually the nurse gives them fluids with their um, medicines and then they get one thing of fluid on their tray. If they are on a push fluids diet, that means we're encouraging them to give fluids and we just keep offering it to them. Throughout the day, they may be getting dehydrated, so we just need to keep giving them more and more fluids. Or just putting fluid in front of them and say, oh, here, here's some tea and see if they drink it. Um, uh, dietary does all of the grinding and chopping and everything. We already talked about likes and dislikes of foods and alternatives. Religious preferences. So these are some more things you need to know. If you have a person and it accidentally comes out, just be aware of their cultural and religious preferences. So Catholic people don't eat meat on Fridays. They still eat fish, but they don't eat meat. Okay. So no meat on Fridays for a Catholic person. Jewish people only eat kosher foods. Kosher is the way that the food is processed. So the food may still look like normal food, but it's how it's processed and packaged and how it gets to them, but then we know that it's labeled kosher. If they ask you, is this kosher, you can go ask the dietitian or the, the dietary department to make sure that this was cooked kosher or that it was processed kosher. They have kosher hot dogs, they have kosher um, pickles. I mean, there's lots of things that are kosher. <laughs> but it has to do with the way that it is processed. So. Your Muslims don't eat pork, so they don't eat bacon. They don't eat, um, if we have barbecue, <laughs> they can't eat sconyers, you know. So just be a little bit cautious of the pork. And then another newer one that we don't have listed on here is we learned that seven-day Adventists don't drink, don't eat caffeine. So they don't eat chocolate because chocolate has caffeine in it. I don't think I could be a seven-day Adventist because I couldn't eat chocolate. <laughs> they can't have sodas. They can't have tea. If they're going to have something to drink, they can't have coffee unless it's decaf. Um, if they're going to have something to drink, it's going to be lemonade or water or juice. So they don't drink anything carbonated that has caffeine in it. And they don't eat chocolates and things with caffeine. So that's your seven-day Adventist. Um, after the cultural things as well, let's see, substitutions we talked about, you can let them know, just go back to dietary and get their substitute, but if it's the wrong diet, let the nurse know. Your environmental factors, it's our responsibility, um, just like you said, Alex, that we're going to make the area clean, we're at that point, waitresses and waiters, trying to make sure that, that everybody's getting what they like to eat, that it's uncluttered, that it's free of odors, that their table is clean, that they have a nice place to sit down and eat. The menus are going to be hanging on the wall so they can anticipate what we're having for the day. Um, we like to sit people at tables where they're socially appropriate with each other. Uh, eating is a social event. They like to talk to each other while they're eating. Um, so we also, when we're passing out trays, you have to pass it to the same table. Don't just give one person their tray and everybody else at the table doesn't have their food yet. So when you think ahead and make sure everybody's tray is ready and then go serve that one table and then go on to the next table and so on. You do have to open up all the cartons for them and take out everything off of the plastic take it off the tray and put it on the table so it looks like presentable. Be courteous, be non-rushed. Um, the clock plate method is used for residents that are hard of seeing or that have visual difficulties. So they can still feed themselves, but you need to put the plate in front of them and then describe to them what's on their tray as though it were the face of a clock. So like at 12 o'clock for your potatoes, Six o'clock is your meat. Three o'clock, yeah, so you're visually impaired people. Three o'clock are your uh, vegetables, and nine o'clock is your bread. And then they can eat and feed themselves, but they just maybe need a little bit of direction on what's on their tray so that they can know where it's at. So that's the clock plate method for your visually impaired people. 
Some people are going to need assistance with manually feeding, and that's what we're going to learn about doing in the video. Um, but make sure that you've washed your resident's hands in case they do use their hands to eat their food. So before meals, we're going to get everybody up and ready and make sure they're dressed and groomed and they have their teeth in. They have to they have their dentures in so they can chew up their food and then wash their hands before they come into the dining room. Uh, the clothing protectors are optional, but some places it's their policy to put them on. We don't call them bibs, we call them clothing protectors. So it's just to keep their clothes clean from spilling the food on them. Uh, make sure you're passing the trays quickly so that they stay the right temperature. They're going to come out in big carts that need to stay closed so that they don't get contaminated and also so it keeps in the heat to keep the food warm. Check your tray card, make sure you're asking the person their name, make sure you're giving them the correct items. If they need help cutting up their meat or seasoning their food or opening up the seasoning packet, then just help them get it all set up and ready to go. As you take your tray in. Hmm? As you take the tray in. Yeah, so when you take the tray in, just unpack it all for them and make sure they can get to everything. As, they, as you get older, you lose feeling in your hands, and it's harder for you to open packages or open seasoning things or even twist things open. So just make sure everything is uncovered and unpacked for them. Um, if you are feeding someone, you're sitting down at eye level. You have to sit down to feed them, and you're feeding them enthusiastically and telling them that the food looks good. So don't say, oh, this food looks horrible. How are you eating that? You've got to have a poker face and say, oh, this looks delicious. You've got to encourage them to eat as much as they can for themselves. But if they need a little bit of extra help, you're going to actually spoon it and give it to them, just like you would feed yourself. So don't mix all their food together and put it on a spoon and stick it in their mouth. Give them a little bit of something. Give them some water to drink. Give them a little bit of something else. Give them some water to drink. Technically, you're supposed to be asking them, what would you like next? You put it on their spoon, and as it's going towards them, you tell them what it is. Okay? So when we go to clinical, you'll see, like, helping people with their meals. And just reminding them what it is on their tray. People with dementia or cognitive problems, they start eating. They forget what they're doing. They start doing something else. They look back at the tray. They're like, we're eating? <laughs> so you got to keep up with just encouraging them to keep eating but not rush them to eat. Um, serve one resident at the table. We talked about that one already. Check them often for um, substitutes, even if it's halfway through the meal and you see they haven't eaten anything. And you can still ask them, would you like a bowl of cereal instead of that fried egg? Or would you like something else instead of what you have? Um, make sure their hands and face are clean when they're finished. A lot of places have wipes that you can wipe them off or just use their napkin and clean their mouth off before they go back out into the facility. Um, this one, again, is just talking about substitutes. Nobody should leave the dining room hungry. They should always be able to eat something that they enjoy. Um, it's not like at home where they're like, this is what I cooked and that's what you're eating. And if you're not, you're going to bed hungry. <laughs> um, prepare the residents for their meals. If they're going to eat in their rooms, they can stay in their bed and eat if they want to. But they need to be sitting up in the bed in high Fowler's position. So they need to be at least 75 to 90 degrees if they're going to be eating in their bed. Cover them with their napkin, their clothing protector if they agree to it and then encourage them and help them push their overbed table where they can see the food and they can reach it and feed themselves. Um, the spoon, they are gonna ask you a question about how much food to put on the spoon. Again, it's like feeding yourself. You don't get a big heaping tablespoon full of food and cram it in your mouth. You put about a third of the spoon full. <laughs> in the video it says a half, but a third to a half of the spoon full. You don't Fill the spoon heaping full and cram it in their mouth and expect them to eat it. Be aware of your food temperatures. Don't mix your foods together. Offer small bites. Offer liquids in between the bites and then make sure you're not rushing them. Um, always uh, with the liquids, you know, like you're normally eating yourself. You eat a little bit, then you drink a little bit. Then you eat a little bit, then you drink a little bit. So offer that in between. 
it's a lot of times some people can drink it through a straw, but if they have nectar thick or honey thick liquid, they can't suck that through a straw. You're just gonna have to pour it up and it pours out like honey into their mouth. I have a question. So you That's why feeding is everybody all hands on deck. We're all in there. Even the dietary aides come in and help with feeding because people need help with feeding. So passing out trays, getting people set up, all the nurses are there. A lot of the um, administrative staff comes in sometimes to help with meals. The dietary staff is there. The dietary aides will help. After we get everything out, then we all sit down and make sure everybody is eating. And as students, they love to have students because then you can sit with one of their people and help them eat. And family members too. Families come in during meals and help people mm -hmm. eat. Like sometimes they just come during meal time to help the person eat from the meal. And so, and like I said, it's a social event. So we hopefully everybody, and it's better if we all come into the dining room and eat together so we can see them eating. Um, there has to be a nurse in the dining room at all times when people are eating in case something happens and they start choking. But you'll all learn the Heimlich maneuver. So if your person starts choking and they're really choking, not making any sound and starting to turn blue, do the Heimlich maneuver on them okay. and then call for help and we'll come in, you know, but there should be a nurse there in the dining room. But now if you're feeding someone in their room, you're going to be the only one in there and you need to stay with them while they're eating in their room. Some high risk patients, we don't let eat in the rooms alone, but that's why we say you have to raise their bed up 75 to 90 degrees before you leave them in there to eat their food by themselves. But you really don't have to leave them in there, right? No, but some people like to eat by themselves, but I they get that, more. So I, don't leave them in there. I don't want to leave them either because I'm thinking if you choke on yeah. that food and then, yeah. then at least leave the door open yeah. so we can, people walking by could stick their head in and see what's going on. But in assisted livings, people eat in their little sweets. They take food back home and then they eat it. And, you know. Providing good oral care, make sure you're brushing their teeth. All right, this is how we're going to feed each other. Wait till he eats the fruit. <laughs> So offering them liquids in between the body. Now that we have finished your meal, you can eat. 
Hmm? We had to record them several times. <laughs> we spent all day recording them. Because the the it just no, changed this July. Some of them are different. Hours, so the and I just for at least twenty minutes. I gave everything back with me to the kitchen and. I had a question. Uh -huh. Okay, so just like that. So when I was working at Kamu, um, the CNNs would leave their trays right there at the door. Now, is it your job to bring the trays in there from, you know, the residents from upstairs? Yeah, they're supposed okay. to bring them back to the kitchen for y'all. Thank you. Yeah, <laughs> you're supposed to take them back to the kitchen or the carts that they came out on. After you've taken all the trays off the cart and delivered them to everybody, then you can put dirty trays back on the cart. But don't put dirty trays on the cart if there's still trays on there that haven't been passed out. They need to bring them back to the kitchen. So even if they have their uh, their adaptive equipment or their modifications, make sure you're taking that back to the kitchen. So their their handled spoons, their weighted spoons, or their forks, or their plates, um, divided plates or plate guards, all that goes back to the kitchen to be washed and cleaned so they can send it out again for the next meal. They don't keep those in their room with them because then we can't clean them. Okay? Those weighted spoons and modifications come from occupational therapy. They're the therapists that are going to help them with their ADLs. And, but they only have one set of those spoons for that person. And then they have to keep going back to get cleaned and then come back out on the next tray. Some people have certain cups, like little sippy cups or little cups that have two handles on them that they can hold and use. Dysphagia, we already talked about, is difficulty chewing or swallowing food. Sometimes if you've had a stroke or a head injury, maybe you're paralyzed on one side. If you're feeding a person who's had this paralyzed on one side, put the food on the good side. Put the food on the side they can chew it on, and then they can swallow it. But aspiration means breathing that food or fluid or vomitus back into their lungs. We talked about when somebody's having a seizure, you just roll them on their side so that if they happen to vomit, it's going to come out and it's not going to go back down their trachea and get into their lungs. Sometimes people just are coughing. Every time you give them a, something to eat, you give it to them and they cough. You give it to them and they cough. They are probably aspirating on their food. The speech therapist needs to know so they can get assessed for that. They'll do a swallow study for them. Um, but let us know if you notice that they're choking and coughing every time they're eating. What they try to tell them to do is to sit up straight and tuck their chin down when they swallow. If they tuck their chin and swallow, it'll go in. But if they had their head tilted back, like you're giving them breath for the CPR, you have their trachea or their airway open. So if they're sitting, just have them tilt their head forward to try to uh, prevent dysphagia. Um, sometimes they just feel like something's caught in their throat. They're going to start losing weight. They're going to get pneumonia a lot. They're going to have a decreased appetite. They're going to start getting fevers because their lungs are filling up with infections. Um, your dysphagia diet are the ones that need the thickened liquids like we already talked about. There's a powder called thicket that we have to put in everything. And it has to be different consistencies in order for them. It's therapeutic, so it's ordered by the speech therapist according to their swallow study. Um, some people are nectar thick, some people are honey thick, but it just depends on how it's going to mound on your spoon or pureed. And then just with the straws, like I said, it's hard to suck that stuff through a straw. Think about sucking a milkshake through a straw. You get a headache from that, right? <laughs> so sometimes you may just need to spoon it into them or just pour it into them. <clears throat> but some people do suck it through a straw. <laughs> uh, important behaviors we already talked about reporting all of our intake and output, consistently eating less than 75% of the meals you're going to let the nurse know. If they are constantly playing with their food, if they don't like certain food groups, if they keep telling you that they have a dislike, let us know so we can put it on their dislikes and it stops coming out on their tray. 
Um, this one is some more about what should be passed on to the nurse, any choking, any difficulty swallowing, frequent complaints about their food, um, trembling hands where they can't feed themselves their food anymore, changes in their attitude, if they're depressed, they're lethargic, they don't like to eat, or they complain about mealtimes, or they're avoiding mealtimes, then let us know. These are some of your special devices like we talked about from occupational therapy, different handles, different curvatures, different plate guards, all of these certain modifications that they're going to use to help them feed themselves. The goal for rehabilitation is that they are able to take care of themselves. So we need to give them the equipment that they need to use to be independent. And people, even if it takes them longer, they feel better about themselves if they feel like they can take care of themselves. So you're not supposed to rush them or hurry them or just do it for them. You're supposed to let them figure out how to get it to feed themselves. Especially if they're just for short-term rehab, they can't go home unless they've met these goals. And if you keep doing it for them, they're never going to meet their goal. And then they're going to be stuck there forever. <laughs> so you have to be encouraging but not mean. But tell them that they can do for themselves. Okay. We already talked about the dietary supplements, providing concentrated nutrition when they need extra calories that they can't get on their own. Maybe they're having difficulty chewing or swallowing, or they just don't really feel like eating a lot of food. Um, some people eat better when they have liquids to wash it down. Some people drink liquids better than they eat solid food. If they're NPO, we already talked about this a little bit, nothing by mouth because they're going for a procedure. Take the water pitcher out of their room so we don't accidentally fill it up when we're doing water pass. There's hydration pass that when we're passing out snacks, you also refill their water pitchers. They have to have access to clean water 24 seven. So in their rooms, if they can drink clear liquids, they have an ice pitcher filled with water. The special fluid orders, this is where it says encourage the fluids, give them a variety of fluids. Fluid restriction, they're limited to what they can have. So you can't just keep giving them water and juices and drinks all day long. You have to let the nurse know how much they're really taking in. A lot of people in heart failure or liver failure have ascites or fluid that builds up on their stomach and their lungs. And they can't have so much fluid, extra fluid or extra water. Um, so they put them on this fluid restriction diet. But if they're not drinking enough fluid, your people start getting dehydrated, the best way to know if someone's dehydrated is to look at their urine. So if they urinate and it is bright yellow or dark, dark concentrated yellow, that means they're getting dehydrated. They need to drink more water. They need to drink more fluid. Um, peg tubes, feeding tubes, NG tubes, this is called enteral nutrition. Your responsibility for enteral nutrition is to make sure that the patient's head of bed stays up at least 75 degrees every time they're getting fed, and at least 30 to 45 degrees after they've been fed. They can't lay flat. Even if you need to lay them down to roll them or reposition them, you need to get the nurse to turn off the pump or ask them how long it's been since they had their bolus feed. Or just get the nurse to give you their care plan and help you with turning them because if you lay them flat, their fluid is just going to come up and aspirate on it. You need to make sure you're not pulling out their peg tubes. Some people have NG tubes where it's going through their nose and into their, in, through their nose, nasogastric. So it goes in your nose, down your esophagus, straight into your stomach, gastric. Um, if you see it pulled out and it's like hanging out way over here, let us know because it's not in their stomach anymore. Don't shove it back in there because yeah. you could be shoving it into their trachea and into their lungs. Um, some people will bunch it up into their mouth and when you open their mouth, they'll have like curls of the tube in their mouth. We need to know that because it's not in their stomach anymore. And then some people have the tubes that are G-tubes that are surgically implanted into their abdomen. And when you're rolling and repositioning them, you're not supposed to lay them on that tube or kink that tube off or pull that tube out. There's a little ball at the end of these tubes that they blow up. It's like a little balloon, but that's just what's in there and you can pop it out and then they'll have a hole coming out of their stomach. So just be careful of these peg tubes. Little, little kids have them too, um, Mickey buttons, or NG tubes that are in because they need it to go directly to their 
stomach. So this is a picture of it just going kind of into their stomach. Sometimes we do gravity feeds where we just pour water in it and it just goes in like a straw straight to their stomach. If you work for a home health and you have a patient who feeds themselves through in enteral nutrition, they will train you how to do that. So you can do some on-the-job training to learn how to do peg tubes and feeding tubes and things. And they do it a lot with children with special needs. Um, IV therapy is another way that we're going to get fluids in our body, but you don't, you're not responsible for maintaining the IVs. The only thing we need from you is that you're recording the intake of the IV fluid if your facility lets you. Usually it's the nurse that's going to check the IV pump and write down that amount of fluid as well. What we want the CNA to do is to let us know that the site is looking okay and it's not leaking all over their bed. And if you go in and you walk in and the whole bed is soaking wet because the IV came out, you need to let us know. Or if the patient's complaining that their IV site is burning or it's starting to swell up or it's starting to get red, then let us know. So that observation of the IV site, everybody needs to look at it every time you go in the room to make sure it's still in place and to make sure that it's not infiltrated or not blowing up their skin with fluid. Um, but don't touch the pumps if they're beeping. If you press the wrong button, you could turn it off. You could also make it just infuse everything that's in that bag within a few seconds or minutes. So if it's beeping, let the nurse know. But if your responsibility is to report the abnormalities at the site, so your bleeding, puffiness, paleness, complaints of pain, hot, cold, um, and then all of the systemic problems that people have when they have an infection, just your fever, itching, drop in blood pressure, um, irregular pulse, turning cyanotic, having difficulty breathing, having shortness of breath. All of those things are things that you report stat or immediately. When they have this IV, they, they really don't have the needle still stuck in them. The needle comes out once we put it in. The needle comes out, it's just a little plastic tube that's in their vein. But it's still considered biohazardous. So if it comes out, it needs to go in the sharps container and then we put a bandage and hold direct pressure on there. Um, evaluating your intake, we already talked about doing your I's and O's and um, recording it on your chart as a solid foods or an estimated amount of what is given. But if we have a liquid food like a soup, that counts as fluids for your adding up your fluid part. And one ounce is 30 milliliters. Um, this is a nutritional intake sheet. Everywhere you work is going to be different. Where they want you to put the um, intake and output on. So just know how you're supposed to chart in your facility. Um, closely monitor new admissions to make sure that they are eating. Make sure that they actually got a meal because sometimes when they're new admissions, dietary doesn't get their order right away and then they could miss like breakfast and lunch and dinner and then it's like 9 o'clock when they tell you, I haven't eaten anything all day. <laughs> think, what happened? But that communication between the nurse and dietary may not have happened and then we didn't know because we didn't feed them so we just assumed they got a meal. So just make, you're checking those new admissions, making sure everybody has a water pitcher, making sure you're changing those water pitchers every shift, and then remind your residents to drink because dehydration is a medical emergency. Elderly people and very young children get dehydrated very easily. When their skin starts to tint or when you pull up on the top of the palm of your hand, when you pull it up, it should go back down. That means you're hydrated. But if you pull up on the back of the palm of their hand and it tents and stays that way, they're dehydrated. If you're able to pull the skin off of their chest and hold it up, they're dehydrated. Okay. So they can get sleepy. They can get tired, just like you when you get dehydrated. Dry eyes, dry mouth, feel horrible. They get constipated. So lots of things happen, but it is a medical emergency when people are dehydrated. And we talked already about the weight. Weight is the most important indicator of nutritional status. So we make sure we get a good weight. We weigh them at least once a month. And we go by the doctor's orders about when we're weighing people. And then we're making sure that that baseline weight is an accurate weight. If your facility wants you to leave their shoes on when you weigh people, leave their shoes on. If your facility says take their shoes off to weigh people, 
do it the way you're supposed to because everybody else is going to be doing it that way. And we need to make sure that those weights kind of stay as accurate as possible. Um, what you need to know about the food groups, just basic general information. There's no longer a food pyramid. It's a food plate. All of the food groups are equally important. You should have small amounts from each food group. Um, but your dairy foods give you your calcium, your vitamin D, but they also contain the most fat. So if you have a person on a fat-restricted diet, they're not going to have a lot of cheese and butter and milk and dairy products. Those are the most fattening foods. A lot of people think that meat are fat, but meat is actually protein, and you're not really eating the fat on meat unless you're eating bacon. <laughs> it's lean meats. We grill our chicken or we drain the fat off of it before you eat it. But dairy products are fat. That's what you're eating is the fat. So um, it gives you lots of calories. So we give whole milk to them because it has lots of fat and lots of calories in it. Your fruits and vegetables give you all of your vitamins like vitamin C and vitamin A that are important to help with your um, fighting off infection. Your breads and grains give you folic acid and B vitamins. So you can't avoid breads and grains forever. Doing a keto diet, yes, we're trying to avoid the breads and grains, but we are missing out on folic acid and B vitamins. So, and then the meat has all of your protein in it. So that means you're going to stop because you're going to eat some of them vitamins. <laughs> That's why we take a vitamin supplement. We take a folic acid or a multivitamin and some B vitamins. But B vitamins are actually important for your nervous system. So you get stressed and you get like agitated and you get mental problems if you don't have enough vitamin B or you can't sleep well or you have no energy <laughs> people who take B12 injections because they're not absorbing but B12 but B12 gives you energy and so B, B vitamins are really important for your nervous system so if you are completely avoiding grains and breads, you're missing out on a lot of B vitamins that are good for your nervous system. So. <laughs> Make sure you're doing a small amount of food. It's called myplate.gov now for your um, 